It's wonderful to be here in St. Louis. Thank you to everyone who made it possible for me to be here. It's um, a very <coughs> circuitous full circle moment. Um, Lisa Melandri and I met years ago when I was a baby curator, arts administrator, didn't know what I was doing. Maybe I would get a PhD, maybe I wouldn't, who knew? Um, when she was working at Santa Monica Museum of Art and it's wonderful to be here now with you here as director of CAM. I also um, did a curatorial fellowship as part of my art table um, fellowship that Lisa mentioned <coughs> at La Mar Sculpture Park in St. Louis. So I've spent some time here and have grown to love the city over the last 10 years. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here in conversation with Dominic and t thinking so deeply um, and poetically about this place, which is a very complicated city, as many of you in the audience know. Um, and maybe somebody like Dominic, who's grown up here, could um, talk a little bit about um, St. Louis as the kind of um, muse for this show and um, how you think about the kind of complexity of the city and how you've decided to render it in the paintings that are on view. I appreciate the question, Tiffany, thank you. Um, first, a sincere and profound thank you to everyone who showed up tonight. You, um, you know, to quote Jay-Z, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us right now. So thank you all for your time. Um, it is an honor to be able to come back here and, you know, to get to Tiffany's questions, I must first contextualize how important the show is, not only for um, me as an artist, but me as an individual. Because what this show represents, in a lot of ways, is um, the final chapter of my origin story, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I left here um, 10 years ago to pursue my life in the arts, and, you know, leaving St. Louis was a very difficult and complicated thing for me, in a lot of ways. You know, most because my entire family's here. And when I grew up here, we grew up in the northern part of St. Louis under, you know, impoverished and insufficient um, circumstances, right? And I don't necessarily want to belabor that particular point because that is something that, you know, we as people in Missouri and as native sons and daughters of St. Louis is not really what we do. You know, we persevere, we endure, and we're resilient. Um, when it comes to the overall complexity that came with my upbringing here is that the complexities was all environmental and circumstantial, you know? And it's this emphasis on the environment that was quite important to me when it came down to understanding and recontextualizing my relationship to this city in its entirety, right? Um, and so, leading into the kind of, um, I wanna say, hmm, I'm taking my time to think, because if, if I don't, we'll be here forever, <laughs> you know? Yeah, once I start talking, I won't stop. And so I'll try to be as succinct and as clear as possible. Which, as Pisa said, landed us at actually a three hour <laughs> Zoom call. Yeah, that is you know, transcribed. So I'm keeping that in mind, man. So I'm, I'm like, like Yo, those I of start? you who are going to purchase this catalog, be, be ready, okay? Yeah, the pages I'm like, go on and on and on. So yeah. <laughs> it's lovely, but yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so. What was amazing about St. Louis is this deep sense of community that I felt. You know, I was extremely well nurtured while I lived here, despite the, you know, imperfect circumstances that I was born in. And so when it came down to me coming back, I really wanted to examine and highlight the kinds of um, spaces within this environment that we all collectively share and have a relationship to, and how those environments kind of um, not only nurture us, but they kind of ignite our potential to wonder, you know, and to pursue things and to dream about things. And when we enter those spaces, not only do they ignite that potential um, sense of wonder, that thing that lives within all of us, but it's also sharpened by the people you meet within those spaces as well, whether it be, you know, your professors, which is what they were for me and perhaps for yourself as well, Tiffany, but also, you know, people who aren't, aren't even around with you at all. So, you know, think about the voices you find in literature and in books. And those things to me became extremely important when I thought about retroactively, how was it that I came to be where I am? And it's due to spaces like this and with people like you. And so I wanted to really commemorate those spaces in this exhibition. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't you know if that really, answers the question about it does. Yeah, no, but absolutely. But I can't do that without talking about y'all, you know? Um, and there, I mean, this is as, um, you'll see once you get the book, this is an extended, this is like a kind of follow-up conversation to the already extensive conversation we've had in the exhibition catalog. And I have to let you know that it's really not, I mean, it's, it's edited, but like not much. So you're, you're gonna get a lot. And so one of the questions that I had for Dom 
when we were pre um, preparing for the catalog was, you know, why St. Louis? What was it? What did it mean to him and to be um, portraying it in, in these paintings? So you'll get a lot of that in the book. So that was a great answer to just be like, oh, this is a little sprinkling. You can get the, you can get the real details in the book. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the title of the show, so maybe a, a little bit more about St. Louis, but, and, but you kind of spoke to this as kind of this completion of your origin story, um, and it's called Birthplace, and it's not called something like Home, mm -hmm. um, which I was really struck by, and I wasn't really thinking about when we first talked, but since um, reflecting on it and preparing for the conversation today, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that choice of title, um, whether you made it or not, but like what birthplace means to you versus like signaling a home or um, a place of origin. Like we have all these other words to describe where we're from, um, but you chose birthplace, um, I think specifically because you are so intentional about your practice. So I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the title. You know, I'm going to be completely honest with you all. I struggled greatly with how I wanted to title this exhibition and really how I wanted to frame it. But, you know, I'll just be extremely candid about how I came to the title of Birthplace. I remember I was laying in my bed, hanging out with my dog, and I was like, wow, I really got to sharpen my mind about this show. And I was listening to this, <laughs> I was listening to this Little Yachty album. And, you know, and what struck me about this album in particular was the title of it. So the title of his album was called Let's Start Here. And I love that, you know, this idea of like, let's start here. You know, this point of departure, what do you start from? And what is um, awaiting from you and this kind of commencement to something, right, that you're about to encounter. And for him, it was this new trajectory within his practice as a musician and as a rapper to produce this kind of like Afrocentric, like futuristic, like psychedelic album, you know. And so it showed a distinct change in pattern for, you know, what we understood his method methodology was as a rapper and as a hip hop artist. And so when it came down for me, when I thought about, you know, St. Louis as my home and how I wanted to commemorate my time here and to really bring a piece of myself back here to all of you that we can all collectively um, examine and understand and also see ourselves within, it became, it became important for me to understand that we aren't, or let me say this, from the moment like we're all born, we have this expectation that like we are fully realized individuals, right? Like you are with your family, you're in the same, you're in St. Louis, and there's a certain context for how you identify yourself in a certain place. And for me, it was the fact that I found myself not only as a native son to St. Louis, but also identified myself as an artist, as a thinker. And if those things are true, what gave birth to these other sides of my identity? You know, this kind of collective identity. What produced variegation inside of me, right? And that's something that I think is. Um, quite a natural phenomenon throughout growth and as, as a, per, a point of um, just personal development. And so if we're thinking about this idea of variegation and the idea of like giving life to a different type of um, set of priorities or investments with you as both a thinker and as an in individual, well, what are the kind of birthing grounds for that self? You know, like where, where do they start? And for me, it all came in the classroom and, you know, recognizing that I was a bit of a teacher's pet growing up, you know what I mean? And it was through the voices of like my professors and through the voices of books that they really kind of sharpened and nurtured and allowed this part of me to be, to have not necessarily an easy birth, but a, an enriching birth, right? That's something that can be sustained and nurtured and um, can generate a different type of relationship to this life that we have as artists, as thinkers. And so that's where this idea of birthplace came from, is that, no, it's not just that you come from a certain city, in a town, in a state, but that you literally engage with a different type of re reawakening in a lot of ways, right? And that reawakening that you encounter happens through an engagement with materials, ideas, spaces, landscapes, and that just to me was um, extremely poignant as a, um, a starting point for me. That's yeah. such a beautiful description and I think really encompasses the, 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 the breadth of the show. Um, and you see all of this on the, on the walls and in the, um, the gallery space. Um, and I love any, any conversation where we can talk about Little Yachty. I mean, hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, any hip hop reference in any conversation. Um, but, and funny enough, I just saw him perform. <laughs> my mom and my, my brother were, at, were in Austin. I was giving a talk at um, the University of Texas. And it just happened to be Austin City Limits the same weekend. And I was like, oh, I was like, are we going to go? 
And my, <laughs> my mom was like, I'm down. I was like, mom, you're, I was like, okay. She probably was the only 70 year old person in the audience. And she had a great time. She was like, I don't know who little Yachty is, but this is great. I was like, cool. But I love, <laughs> I was like, I love that you're down to be here with us. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, these threads of reawakening and um, uh, uh, new developments, new pathways, um, new directions mm -hmm. in your painting practice. There are so many ways to ask this question and like different spurs. So I'm going to try to get them all in one and you can pick up wherever you want. Um, but there, when I was walking through the show, which is the first time I saw it in person, um, I'm mostly familiar with your other, your earlier work, and is, and mostly through reproduction. Um, but the earlier work, you know, obviously, what's most striking, and we talk about it in the interview in the book, is that there are no figures present. Mm. And even in your other, in your earlier work, the figure is kind of like a ghostly apparitional presence, mm. um, and you're playing with um, light and um, luminosity and transparency and all these kinds of things that are formal, also. Um, and you really see that here too, but without the figure. Mm -hmm. So space, architecture, and I was thinking about how this exhibition also gets us thinking differently about site specificity even. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the, converse, the what you just said about birthplace, it's also kind of that too, which is a highly theoretical idea, but you render it in such a poetic and kind of grounded way at the same time that there's levels of suspension as well in the, in the visual imagery. So I think that's what I, what I want to ask you about is like, what new directions or new techniques um, or um, new ideas were you pursuing when you were making this body of work that were exciting to you, that were challenging, um, that are interesting for th where you want to pursue next? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, it, it's funny. So. <clears throat> for those of you who may not be in Thailand, and I'm sure that's not many of you here because everyone here has probably seen me blow up Facebook with like posts about my work on a daily basis. So, <laughs> but um, yes, yes, Tiffany, you're absolutely correct, right? Well, um, when I, in my earlier work, there was um, a deep attachment to like the figure and the body, but with a very particular um, set of priorities, right? So in a very particular conversation I attempted to have with that figure. And a lot of it stems from this the space of ideas. And so what initially you know, prompted me to start thinking about my relationship to the figure in a more complicated and perhaps um, more rigorous manner was you know, my reading of writers such as James Baldwin in The Fire Next Time, but W.B. Du Bois' ideas in the book The Souls of Black Folks as he talked about you know, um, this idea of living within the veil. And so the way I tend to approach a particular project or any type of um, body of work is I think about, you know, what are the framing, what is the framework for that particular project? What am I concerned with? Who, I'm in, who am I in conversation with? And who, you know, can I read or be in conversation with that has um, a particular language attached to these ideas that seem grandiose, right? And so um, at the onset, I thought about this idea of leisure, right? And leisure as um, a subversive act, but also a political act, and a, com uh, you know, a contemplative act that was quite necessary. And if we think about, you know, the context of our society today, it's, you know, like we have a highly, and I do mean this highly perverted relationship with time, right? And it's this idea that there is no time for anything. You know, you are now at the whim of time as opposed to being a subject to it. You know or what I mean? Or there's no time for anything other than work. Exactly, right? Which there's nothing very specific. Precisely, yeah. And, the, and, and that type of hyperactivity and this, this type of um, commitment to work, right, as this generating force that you have to um, acquiesce and subjugate yourself to, to me was quite problematic when I thought about the history of like black bodies in this country. And so, you know, I became interested in like depicting black bodies in moments of leisure or engaging with books or writing. Because one, in this entire art historical narrative and framework, there just isn't a common image, right, the representation of a black body engaging with literary texts. And that's because of how we understand art history. You know, it's a highly Eurocentric, highly oftentimes white American, or I mean, white European or white male-based framework of understanding, you know, the mechanics of art in a lot of ways, or the kind of like methodology and th um, thought processes of um, artists that were in ty um, of artists. And so for me, as I, you know, starting off on a particular project, I didn't necessarily want to look too deeply at like certain kind of what I would see seen to be um, antiquated relationships to the body. You know, I wanted to expand my ideas and expand the conversation around our understanding of this body and its life. 
And this, Tiffany, I, you know, I told you once I start. I, I, I keep love going. the rambles because they all, they, he because, comes back to it. Yeah, it, every I time. swear. It, it's, I'm long winded, but it, it'll it's connect. Like Dave Chappelle, you get and you're like, oh, whoa, whoa that's what whoa. I was doing this whole hour? <laughs> what? <Go ahead>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, you're trying to see how this makes sense. But I, I promise you, it, it does in a lot of ways because it, it breaks down the way I, th way I think about my, proce my project. And so I am indeed a student of art history, right? So, and I take that very seriously. And so if Tiffany, as she talked about, you know, different modes of making that I have, if you were to acknowledge, you know, my overall practice, you identify what's called color-filled painting, right? And color-filled painting for me is what's been consistent throughout all of my, all of my um, bodies of work. And of course that has to do with like, you know, my earlier training, you know, at Flow Valley and my relationship to color. But it's because I understand that color possesses a lot of magic, right? And it has the ability to influence our understanding of what it is that we're looking at. If you were to consider an artist like Mark Rothko, and you were to go up to see these squares, these hazy edges existing on top of each other, what you're really looking at is the conversation between these two colors. And I thought about the mode of painting and the way of thinking about painting in that way and how it can enhance the relationship to this idea of magic in leisure for the black subject. And so if you were to look at those paintings, they were all mostly dominated by one color. Like they'd be like a red, a blue, a yellow, um, perhaps a green or a black. And it's because I'm interested in the romance language of painting, you know, and like that to me is really beautiful. And so when it came down to me thinking about this particular exhibition here, I didn't necessarily read the voice of Du Bois or Baldwin when it came to do this. Well, one, because I'm quite familiar with the writing and I have my own relationship to it. But I started to read people like poets, you know, someone like Mary Oliver or Tracy K. Smith or more kind of like critical theologians like um, John O'Donohue, who was an Irish theologian and um, philosopher and poet. And um, thinking about how these individuals describe these kind of inner landscapes that we all possess, right? And that was when I was reading John O'Donohue's work, and then I was reading The Oversoul by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this is similar to my practices with the figure, is that what I tend to do is I look for thread lines. What James Baldwin, what W.B. Du Bois, what Zora Neale Hurston, what Toni Morrison all had in common was this relationship to language that examined and understood and identified a surrealist landscape in which the black body is charting through. You know, if you were to think about James Baldwin's conversation with William F. Buckley in 1967, he starts that conversation or his debate with him, acknowledging that what his um, argument, well, you know, Buckley's argument depended on was his sense of reality, right? And what Du Bois also talks about, so again, like this sense of reality, and what for Du Bois, it was this idea that, like, you know, black subjects exist within the veil. And so I saw this kind of like beautiful symmetry between how these writers and these thinkers were teasing out certain ideas. And so as I evolved and I moved forward with this particular project, I had a deep interest in this kind of inner landscape, this place of in interiority and inner investment. So less exterior issues that we're negotiating, but the interior things that we're invested in and to help kind of compose our relationship to ourselves, our practices, and our homes. And that's where writers like Mary Oliver, who has this idea of observing the world with passion, right? And then you recognize that you're tackling things that are a bit, you know, in a lot of ways, I think we talked about this too, Tiffany, in our conversation, that sometimes language is insufficient mm -hmm. to describe that thing that we're trying to hold on to, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why we hear things like the veil, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's, it, obviously it doesn't truly exist, but it's a social phenomenon that you encounter, right? right? And, but we all possess an interior landscape. And right. so from there, I tried to make this work from that place. Yeah. Told you if I keep going. No, but we'll you got to so much, because I'm like, oh, I'm so glad that you brought up surre surre surreality because I was looking at the work again, um, walking through the exhibition before our conversation, and I'm like, oh, the way that you're negotiating outside and inside, mm -hmm. so not just the inner landscape, because it's not a closed off space, right? No. There are also these, the ways that you have that you, that there are windows that are um, present, or you're letting the outside into the interior in this really particular way. And the way that that, um, that outside world is not, it's not necessarily turned upside down, but it's certainly not as, it's not a, a, an authentically real representation, right? Like there are, there's foliage and clouds that you see that like, you're like, well, is this space like in the air? Or are we on the, like, are we in a, uh, like what level of the building are we in when we're looking out at this? Or are we like 
hovering. Mm -hmm. So the idea, so I was also thinking about suspension in your figurative, more, let's say, more figurative work, right? Um, and how the, the figure is suspended um, in time, between time, yeah. out of time. Yeah. Um, and so I was thinking about that, how you're doing that work spatially as well in this, in this body of work. Um, and so I wanted to hear you talk about that kind of like suspended space between reality and surreality that mm. you're doing in terms of landscape and color and space. Mm. Um, it, that's an intentional absenting of the figure, but it's still getting at these concerns that you have across your practice. Mm. Yeah, that's a well. One damn, that's a beautiful observation. Like, it's like good for you. Thanks. I'm like, she's giving me a lot of credit up here. I'm like, okay, like we're like, it's, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> Make me look good, Tiffany. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, yeah, I have an overactive imagination, man. Like so, like even as a student, I like I, I like to think of myself. At least I tell myself my own mind's narrative that I was a good student. But eh, like you know, are like, there I, any I, of Dom's teachers in the room? Oh no! I would, okay, yes. Raise your hands. I will come. Yeah. And we can find you after. Shout bravo! Yo, bravo! Give a yes. round of applause Thank you so them, much man. for being They're with us. Amazing. The educators in the room are so important to this work. <laughs> I'm gonna ask them after the talk. Oh, yo! They'll be coming out with receipts. They're like, Love yo, it. we know, we we know, bro. It. Don't lie up here. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so when it comes to this idea of like exteriority and interiority within the painting, so. Um, the most exterior element that you may see influence that work is this um, attention to cloud in a lot of ways. And for me, you know, as a student, and I don't know if Jana's here, but my middle school teacher would always take my pencils away because I wouldn't stop drawing in her classroom. You know, and she would do that because I would be caught up in reverie, right? Like I would just be caught up in daydreaming and I would like draw all the time. And I became interested in this idea of the classroom as a dreamscape, you know, in a lot of ways. And so, how is it that this space that we, we build, we understand, it's a pedagogical environment and, and there's a, an environment that expects a, a certain type of um, intellectual attention or awareness when you inhabit it. Now what happens when that intellectual awareness is um, compromised through the invasion of clouds or through reverie or the, through a particular type of disruption, you know? And for me, like identifying something as daydreaming or cloud gazing as the medium by which that disruption happens most swiftly was really important for um, articulating those images. And so if you were to consider the painting like Birthplace Red Classroom, that entire like left-hand side of the composition is just a window with like these like soaring red clouds, right? And it's because I just liked the idea that uh, the clouds could invade that space, you know? And then the idea that like you never see the same clouds twice, like clouds provide like so much poetry for us, you know? And I was thinking about this idea that like, Oftentimes we don't really appreciate these things. We're very underimpressed. You know what I mean? It's like really strange that like we live on Earth and we can look up and we can see an atmospheric sky that is constantly changing from one day and into night into a blanket of black with glowing stars. You know, and so this kind of awareness like poetry and how it amplifies the imagination of any type of student to me was like really important for highlighting these um these ex these interior and exterior spaces. Right, and so I think that's where I would kind of go with yeah. it. Yeah, really. no, that's really a beautiful answer. And I was also thinking about not just um, the poetry and being able to um, experience this as, I forget the phrasing that you just used, but it's, a, it's an experience. It's not, it changes how you experience also the world, right? Yeah. And like you're, it reorients you to your own surroundings, which is also something that you were talking about in terms of environment and how, you're, um, how you brought that into the work. Um, and I, I was also thinking about as you were talking, going back to my first question to birthplace, um, which is this relationship between not only birthplace but also world building. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I kept, you, you mentioned Mary Oliver, but also Tracy K. Smith is such Absolutely. a force. Uh, um, and the way she mm. talks about space and astronaut, like, and just like, <coughs> like exploring these different dimensions. And you really, in the terms of like the suspension and not being able to locate as a viewer, in my experience of the work, like, are we on the ground? Are we in the air? Where are we in mm -hmm. this work? Um, I know we're in St. Louis, but like, where dimensionally in St. Louis, you know, like it could yeah. be a St. Louis of the future, a St. Louis of the past. And in fact, often that is the case in all of that work that's in the gallery. So I wanna open it up to questions. I know a lot of you are here to talk to, to hear Dom talk more and I don't need to be taking up the space here. Dom can do that for me yeah, um, as we've I already seen. Too. So please, um, I yeah. hope you have questions <laughs> um, and try to keep it to questions, comments. We would love to hear too, maybe after the talk, but definitely questions first. Don't be shy. Take me a minute to jog back there. Wait. Come in, Charlie. Uh, 
Hi. Um, so my question is, can you speak on your thinking on liberation and freedom in specificity to dreams and time? I feel that is coming through in your work, but I just would like to hear your thoughts. As it pertains to like, um, liberation, freedom, and dreams, in a lot of ways? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, but black liberation, because I think of dreaming and surreal, surrealism, we're imagining ourselves in a future, we're imagining ourselves at a point in time, but also, like, what does it mean to be in the future? What does it mean to see myself in the here and now and in the past, um, in this surreal environment? And how does that relate to liberation or freedom, may, maybe is a better term, how does that relate to freedom in your work? side of these combines of time and space. <laughs> oh, you know, that's such a beautifully rich and complicated question. And again, with, with the interest of time, I'm gonna try and be as succinct as possible because y'all know how I am. But um, I would say that when it comes to the idea of liberation or the idea of, of an enhanced imagination, right? The idea of enhancing one's imagination to you know, shape or construct a reality that is perhaps not yet, yet available or present for them, right? To Tracy K. Smith, who I think is fantastic at addressing these particular issues within her writing. If you're not familiar with her, her writing or any of you, I strongly advise you become well acquainted with it as swiftly as possible. But in her work, she tackled these same type of things, in particular her book, Life on Mars, right? Where we understand our positions as charting out for other things and making sense out of these things that are, are again, grandiose and outside of our scope of understanding. And so for me, when I think about liberation, I think it's important, not only, you know, because again, like we're overly familiar with this very bloody catalog that kind of contextualizes and shapes our understanding here, especially within this country. And so the liberation for me, and this is just the job that I think that I am most effective at, is the liberation of the interior subject, right? I think oftentimes when we think about the black subject, we think about our external bodies and the suffering that we have, as though there is no internal life to that subject either. Right, part of dehumanizing an individual is to rob them of that interiority, right? The idea that their inner landscape is barren, right? And so for me, it's important to, whether I'm speaking you know, with you know, thinkers like Tiffany or with students or, or other artists, I think it's an extremely important like, job that we all have is to hatch new freedom dreams, right? And we hatch those things by having discourse, but also nurturing interiority. That means not overworking yourself and making excuses for that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, but understanding that if you want any sort of liberation, that interior life must be nurtured and it must be secure, you know? And so I, that's the kind of space that I find myself most invested in, and I think it's a real concern for me. Ashe, next question. That was beautiful. I'm glad this is on camera. I love that. <laughs> You're very generous. First, I have a quick statement, which is um, I... I, when I walked through and saw your pieces, I just was taken by them. I loved seeing St. Louis just in the light that you have shown it. Um, and I saw it very selfishly, like, like self-centered, like just a, a white woman who grew up in St. Louis. And I love your, your explanation of it being like black leisure. It uh, reminds me of uh, Derek Adams' uh, Black Joy. It's just, it's lovely. I, I, just wanted to make that statement. But secondly, I'm obsessed with the sculpture and I would love for you to tell us more about it, like everything. Like why, why did you choose? <laughs> I, too, I too am obsessed with this and I'm wanna just, hear more because I, I, we didn't have a chance to talk about it in the um, interview for the book, so yes. Yeah, I just, I, how did you choose the materials? You know, the, the clear, I'm assuming acrylic and um, you know, it's a play, I love playgrounds, so just tell me everything, please. Is this also your first sculpture? It's the second one. Okay. Yeah. It's all a budget reason, that's why. It's like, it's like we not, shit is expensive. You know, it's like making that damn thing. First like, things first, it costs a lot of it, money. Yo, we rocking with a McDonald's budget over here. So I made that thing, I was like, I gotta, yo, that thing exists, I gotta sell a painting. I'm like, this shit is expensive. Oh my God, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right sorry. Oh yeah, um, I'm also, I'm so sorry we didn't get to talk about that sculpture. Um, well, we're I talking apologize. about it now, no, yeah, it's lovely. I'm so glad that you raised this question because this was definitely on the docket, thank you so much. Okay, um, so um, the idea for that sculpture is born again out of 
um, my origin story. And so to be kind of succinct, there was a time in which my family and I had to, you know, sleep in this park. And in that park, there was this playground that, you know, me and my siblings would play on quite a bit. And despite our circumstances, I had the opportunity to like, well, as a kid, I really didn't care because I didn't have an alarm clock. So I could like stay up and play at night as much as I wanted. But because of our circumstances, I had the opportunity to see that playground at night, which is not a common encounter with a playground. When you identify a playground, you oftentimes see it in the middle of the day, children, you know, it's overrun by children, right, and playing. And, but again, thinking about, you know, a very type of site specificity for me and what that did, it really rocked my imagination as a child. When I saw this thing at night, it transformed into what I perceived to be a castle because I only identified its silhouette, you know, because it was cascaded in darkness. And so from then on out, I became really interested in this idea that a particular object can transform during different types of day. And so the different times of day adds poetry to what it is that we're engaging with. And so I was reading the Surrealist Manifesto by Andre Breton. And in that book, he talks about, um, along with, oh, I'm not John Cage, I'm forgetting his name and I'm so sorry. But he was, there was a conversation and, and they talked about this idea of the surreal object, meaning an object that you understand the construction of, the functionality of, but your participation with subverts your understanding of how you intended it to function. And so if I was to think about that playground I saw at night as a castle, and I want to think about that magical nature of that, how could I bring that to, you know, how could I realize that quite literally? And so I got it in my head, that I was like, man, I want to make an invisible playground, you know? And that really was the idea. I was like, I just want a playground that's invisible, because if you were to engage with a playground that way, it would look as though you're walking on the sky. And so the goal was to actually have this thing built and using like really, really high premium like glass that was be strong enough to hold children, you know, and they could like walk on it. And again, you understand what it is. It's a playground, it has bridges, it has peaks, it has a slide, all things that are quite ubiquitous and familiar and helps frame that object. But your engagement with it is where the magic happens. You know what I mean? It subverts your understanding, it subverts your observations of that. Mind you, from what I said earlier, it's a very expensive idea. <laughs> so we work with what we can do. And so uh, to Tiffany's question, was my first sculpture? No, the original model was maybe three feet, and now this one is about the same size as my, as my body. But I hope to continue growing this project, you know, until I can have it finally realized. But it felt important to me because of just how profound that encounter was for me in the city and how that time in my life was really important to make sure that playground came here to y'all. And I didn't want to have the show without it, you know. It's also beautiful to think about it as a kind of prototype or a se like yeah. a second iteration of a prototype, like you're kind of iterating this prototype that will then eventually be some kind of larger scale um, and more maybe, I don't want to say sophisticated materials, but the actual materials that you want to realize it in. So it's lovely to see that we're getting a, a kind of preview of what this could be in the future. Going back to the first question about, this, about futurity and liberation, I'm like, I love that. Yeah. Um, another question in the back. Hi, um, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about community-based work. Um, so I just recently learned that you are a product of Hayeswood East High School. Um, I also am an alum there, so shout out to the educators that are shout in out. the room. Shout out. <laughs> So um, those adults and folks who are familiar with North County would say that a lot of individuals who are creative or in art-based work wouldn't maybe necessarily make it as far as someone like you have. And so um, it truly is a blessing to see that um, and sometimes can seem impossible for black and brown students that are in those spaces. Um, and so my question for you would be, what are key things that you believe should exist in order for black and brown students to really thrive in these spaces like this? And what ways would you encourage them to advocate for themselves so that they could really um, take up space in the way that you have? And any administrators in the building, maybe take some notes. Because <laughs> uh, it's a structural issue. So yeah, thank you for that beautiful question. Yeah, no, I mean, and yes, Tiffany, like, you're absolutely correct. It is absolutely a structural issue. And so, and because it is both a structural and systematic issue, I can't in good faith give you an answer that will solve that problem. I, I can't. But what I can tell you is that I think that if we have a space where ideas are safely distributed, you know, amongst like black and brown people, or those ideas are heard. You know, I think a lot about this artist, Carrie James Marshall, and his relationship to ideas. You know, um, he oftentimes leads a lecture, I listen to a lot of lectures in my studio a lot, because it just helps me feel like I'm in school again. 
And he talks about this idea that if for, in order for you to move forward in any type of life, it's not enough for you to just constantly consume things, but you must also generate things. And that's why I love young people so much, right? Like when you get around those people, you, you can help them generate new ideas. And so the only reason, like, you know, in a lot of ways, despite all the systematic and complicated issues that prohibit them to move forward in a lot of ways, we can break down those doors with different ideas, right? If we allow these, these things to take up space with that kind of um, intellectual and creative rigor. And so what I would always suggest is that get those students around different books, different ideas, and sharpen them up, right? Like at the very least, you know, like lock the body, can't take your mind type of thing. And that resilience is something that is profound. You know, I had no faith at all, and my teachers in here could tell you that this thing was gonna go 100%, but I did have a give them hell attitude, you know? I was very like, like very like go-getter type of guy, you know? And my teachers didn't know, like they saw the kind of like young optimism, you know, all the, oh, I'm gonna make it. And they just kind of like sharpened me with it, right? And they understood that, like, if whether or not it worked out, we'll love you anyway. But the idea that like my ideas found a safe home, that I could sharpen them well, I could think about them, and that they, to this day, are still safe environments for me to like pitch ideas and things to. And I try to do that with students as well. Like, I never want you to feel deterred about a potential thing that you're invested in or you're interested in. I want you to feel committed to that thing, you know, committed to it, sharpen it out. And then if I find that there may be um, some deficiencies in it, we talk about that, you know, and then we make it stronger and then you go on about your way. But that's really how I want to do it. I think that this playing field is beautiful and it should be filled with all types of different people, you know. I love the creative arena and I think that it should be, you know, for all of us. Yeah, I um, just want to add that <laughs> You can st still raise your hand, sir, sorry. Um, <clears throat> just very quickly, that um, I, had some conver I had a conversation with some grad students today at WashU, and they had similar concerns, and this is, you know, this is at the higher education level, right? So this is 20 years out of, um, potentially 20 years out of elementary school or middle school or whatever. And it was really like, there, what I heard from them was like, we need more people like you in the room so that we can hear you talking about your journey and you giving us these like cheat codes, because I was, I was like, listen, this is how I did it. I, don't, I was like, I don't know who the person is gonna be for you to unlock that door, but I sure would find them because otherwise you're gonna be stuck on this wheel and it is structural and there's not much that you can do as an individual, but collectively, if you can find other people who share your same concerns and can speak back to the systems or, or even um, develop counter systems that are kind of on the, on the, on the periphery, then great, Ex like exercise that, exploit that. And then once it becomes you know, discovered or co-opted, change it again, you know, like just keep being nimble. Um, so I think to your point also, maybe Dom would love to have a conversation with your students or share with them the recording. Again, these archival materials are so important to be able to share with students to be like, look, there are people doing this work. It's not been easy, but there are pathways, so. Good evening, <clears throat> beautiful exhibition. Um, curious, you left St. Louis. Oh, there you are. Yeah, here I am. Oh, I was like, where's that voice? Ha have you ever, have you ever considered coming back to St. Louis? If not, why not? And if so, what would it take to bring you back as you know, a, a very successful artist? Oh yeah, I totally think about coming back to St. Louis. You, know, it's, uh, you can live here, it's affordable. I live in Connecticut, man. This is expensive, it's, it's expensive over there. Absolutely, I've thought about it. You gotta sell more paintings, yeah, more no, and more for real. Paint. You know, and I'm like, my goodness gracious. But you're like, I'm trying to divest from labor. I wanna, yeah, I, I wanna, le I wanna chill. I, I live my life. Exactly. I used to have long hair, y'all. Like, got up here. It comes with a price, you feel me? But, <laughs> uh, jokes aside. But um, I'm sure I'll come back to St. Louis at some point. I mean, I, I love the community I have here, you know, and I wanna make sure they're all good. Like, even when I come back, which is kind of like in really quick and short bursts, I still try to make it a priority to see all the people that I love and you know, make sure they're okay or talk to them when I, I can. But um, I mean, I, I, I'm also just like a very, very, God, this sounds so contradictory. I can't believe I'm gonna say this shit. I'm like a really busy person too. And I'm also a studio rat. Like, it's, like if you were to come to Connecticut, you'd be hard pressed to get me on my studio. And so it's less now about like where I am and more so just like my attachment to working and making things and you know, I have a dog now, and we both like love being in my studio. And so, you know, and obviously, yes, you can have a studio here, but again, it's just probably me being lazy and I don't want to move or move all this. And I make big paintings, and the idea of it just stresses me out. You know, so I mean, it may not be the most intellectually aware answer, but it's an honest one. It's like, I, 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 I think about this stuff a lot. 
There is know. a lot of space though here. Don. That, there is you a lot buy of space. A whole warehouse. I, 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 or two. <laughs> so, or two. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, that, indeed, it is a possibility. Um, I would love to take uh, maybe like one or two more questions yeah, together. Right. Oh, three, because there was definitely the hand in the back. I saw you a long time ago, and I want you to get your time in. So the last three questions, we can take them as a cluster, and then Dom will, and then we'll wrap it up so that you can have more time with him and sign your books. Yeah, thanks Yay. for your time, man. Um, I'd like to know, focusing or, or thinking more about the absence of black bodies and black leisure, um, how they play a role um, similar or how they differ in two pieces in particular, um, the one depicting the St. Louis Art Museum and Fairgrounds uh, Park. Um, how, what, what's been your experience in how the absence of the black body and black leisure affect uh, either of those um, sites? As in how it's experienced? How, yes. Okay, yes. I, I was like, I think I know mm -hmm. where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. I love that you're being so diplomatic with this question. Yeah. Next, <laughs> next question, and then the one in the back, and we'll, and then Dom can answer all of those at once. There was a question over here? Yes. Uh, yeah, I actually, um, oh, Tim. Yeah. Uh, to piggyback off the last one, um, the St. Louis Art Museum was highlighting some of the, paint, the paintings that you said were important to your work, and I was curious about the relationship between water lilies in your work. Oh, like the Monet water lilies? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then the last question in the back. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It seems like this is a very hyper-local experience for you and for us as an audience. Um, but your work has been shown the world over, so I'm curious to know if the response that you receive from audiences is different uh, in different cities and different co countries. All right, love, oh yeah, I can knock them out. So we'll go. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go in reverse order now. So to the water lilies. Um, so when I went to the St. Louis Art Museum, I, I don't remember the year of this, but I remember um, as a kid there was a time in which those water, so you notice when you go to St. Louis Art Museum today, you might see one of the water lilies on the main wall, right? I remember being perhaps like in maybe early high school and they were promoting an exhibition where they got all of his water lilies together. And so what, I remember being a kid and thinking like, oh my God, this isn't the only one, you know? And the idea that these objects had different homes across the globe and they could be summoned back into our location. Right, and so when I went to the, see the show, it was like all of his water lilies were across that space. And so <clears throat> that experience to me was just very rapturous. Like that's really what it was. I, I felt such rapture when I saw that work and understanding that these objects were siblings, right? There was a unity amongst them that they all lived in different parts. And I don't know who the curator was, but that was a brilliant idea to summon them back together and to reunite them for our experience. And I tend to think about like a project I'm currently working on now called the Rainbow Project that has a relationship to Ellsworth Kelly's spectrum. That these paintings will again live in different places, but if an institution wanted to show them, if we were to collect all of them again, it will complete the fully realized piece. You know? So that was really my fascination with it. But it doesn't necessarily, like the water lilies didn't have like a profound impact on like my practice, but more so my appreciation for the utility of art objects, right? And the kind of like aesthetic life of art objects. But when it comes down to this idea of leisure for the work, I, I should have been more specific and clear in how I was trying to outline this distinction. So the idea of leisure, as you would see it most evidently in my work, was probably more along the lines in my figurative work that Tiffany was um, outlining in the earlier questions. But I do think the idea of slow looking or observing with passion is a space of leisure for those um, images in a lot of ways. Like I think about um, the St. Louis Art Hill painting as being a very kind of like very um, excited and very fast type of looking, right? Like when there's so much visual activity for you. But Fairground Park, things are quieter. It's a slower looking, right? It's a bit more somber in tone. There's grays and splashes of color on the pavement. But when I thought about, the, and I'll talk briefly about those too before moving on to like the last question in the back about my reception, I believe. Whew, girl, that memory, you I really didn't know if I was gonna get that. I was that. like, I'm here. I was like, I'm here yo, to I, was, I think the it. last one's the in the back. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Put on my art hat again. Okay, I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, so the Art Hill painting, like, again, was born out of a memory where I saw these kites in Art Hill and just like this kind of really rigorous and like profound sense of wonder I felt when I observed them. And it's because our art museum, super fucking dope, it's really great. I think that I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. It exists within a particular landscape. Like, I went to um, undergrad in Milwaukee, 
and their land, their art museum is on the water, right? Ours exists within this very lush and profound landscape of greens, and it almost invites leisure, you know, just walking through Forest Park. And when you go up that hill, what greets you is our institution, you know what I mean? And so when I thought about this idea of kites being flown there, I thought about the idea of the kite as being a signal. You know, it alerted me that I was somewhere special, that something was happening there. And so if you see those little figures on the ground flying the kites or looking at them, it was really a product of memory, you know? And in my way, and in kind of like my artistic kind of pedagogy in a lot of ways, is that for me, I think about memory as a figure, you know, a lot of ways, right? So if you think about, you possess a body. Now, if any of you have taken figure drawing classes, like I have here, it's like we, I, we use a particular language when we identify the body that we're observing as the figure, right? And what is a figure? It has limbs, it has legs, it has fingers, all these things that make up a collective whole of something. For me, there was a symmetry to that and that painting, and the idea of memory, right? Memory is a construction. Oftentimes, it ages over time. It's not as perfect as it once was. And it's also a collection of different forms that composite memory. Right? And that, to me, was an entryway of how I started to think about that. And so I didn't need the figure in a lot of ways because the figurative life of that work exists within my consciousness, within the memory, and it's embedded through into the painting. You know? And then when it came to Fairground Park, same thing. Um, I want to interject real quick yeah. because there is um, a brief kind of uh, passage of conversation that we have in the book that I think also might target your question a little bit more because um, what I hear in your... Um, question is also a kind of like political edge that's about space and colonialism and um, the development of St. Louis and the St. Louis mm. Art Museum as a as a site that is also attached to the World's Fair and exhibition of, of ethnic others and has a whole complicated history that we actually do gloss in the interview. Yeah. Tiffany and wanted so, to go in on me and say, what do you think about the World's Fair? And I was like, I was like so, nothing at all. I was like, memory? <laughs> Nothing at all. I was like, memory, nostalgia, architecture, colonialism, nothing, nothing, anything, anything. So there is a little bit of that in the, in the book, so I just wanted to highlight that because I know what you're asking and I wanted, to get, I wanted you to get yeah. your answer. And I want to be fair to you, though, and what, I'll get back to that. So when it comes to like, an audience reception to my work, I mean, I'm drinking when we meet, so I think it's great. I'm teasing. I'm te I think it's great. <laughs> like, but yeah, I, as so far, they've been pleasant. I've met, I mean, the art world is filled with a diverse and eccentric collection of people, so you just never know like what you're expecting. But I've also been very forced to meet, you know, pretty warm and fair-minded folks. You know, like they tend to have a really generous and warm relationship to like my work. So I, nothing crazy has happened to me yet when I've like encountered people both here or abroad. But when it comes to like this kind of political nature of the image of the St. Louis Art Museum, because I do think it's important, because Tiffany cares a lot about this, and I think it, it matters. But because I, it, you know, I want to be clear in how I'm going to frame this. And it's not that I disparage, you know, looking at that particular political framework of that image, right? I don't. I mean, the political life of any type of art object is essential mm -hmm. for what we constitute and what dictates artwork, right? It, every work has a political life. Mm -hmm. For me, when I thought about, you know, the St. Louis Art Museum, the, the history of the World's Fair for me was kind of like a roadblock. No, I didn't know what I could do moving forward beyond that particular idea, right? And that was always my idea or my kind of agitation around it is that once I identify or interrogate or examine that information, what then? You know, it's like I want to figure out how can I evoke that sense of wonder? Because again, we're familiar with that particular relationship to a space and environment. We know how to interrogate it. We know how to talk about that stuff. You know, it happens in political discourses and academic discourses a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, how do you create, you know, a conversation around this sense of wonder that just doesn't really happen in academic spaces often? Not that I have encountered. Right? And so, again, I'm not disparaging them to, but I think about a different set of um, priorities for me. Like, for me, there is an interconnectivity between the aesthetic and wondrous life in a, of an art object and the interior landscape that you possess. And that, for me, was a, la like, a conversation that, w it felt a bit more refreshing for me in terms of like, what I could get out of it for both like, you know, my viewer, but also for the larger conversation. You know? And that's just kind of how I, I try to approach a lot of things. You know, it's like you have a particular catalog that you're overly familiar with, and I don't know if it, it, it enhances one's interior life. It may make it a bit more complicated, because you're like, man, damn, ain't nothing sacred around here. Like, there's problems everywhere we look. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's true, but, you know, I, I try to expand different landscapes of thinking, you know. 
And to that point, last thing, um, to the reception question, that uh, this is a very hyperlocal um, exhibition, and I would encourage you all to familiarize yourself with um, Dom's even more expanded painting practice and sculpture practice now, um, because there are bodies of work that are different from what's on view here, um, related but different. And so to your question about reception, that's also something to like kind of, kind of explore the multiple bodies of work that Dom has produced that is being collected worldwide, which is, yay, congratulations. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, get your books, get your pens ready for signage. Thank you.